Okay. Good late morning uh, to everybody. We are going to the last uh, session. It is the last of the last part of the conference, and we are going to enjoy a presentation that is coming from France, from Rensa. Uh, effect of post treatments on the fatigue properties of additively manufactured tea, titanium, six aluminum, four vanadium, thin samples. Uh, there are uh, a few French authors, but the one that is going to speak is Monsieur Bouffier. Thank you very much. Abou Monsieur. Thank you. Right. Um, so yes, indeed. Uh, but this is the, the work of uh, Theo Persono. It's the PhD work. So 10 minutes for three years of work. This is going to be quick, right? I'm warning you. But I'll try to give the main results. Um, so the idea, so this was part of a larger project called Fascinae with many partners. And uh, the main partner was actually Airbus, the, the <coughs> plane manufacturer. And the idea was uh, what can we do with additive manufacturing if we cannot machine the samples? Because usually what people do is they produce a bar, they machine a sample, they produce the volume curve, usually it's quite good, uh, it's not, it depends on how you work. And then they say, that's it. But sometimes, for obvious reasons, like in the case of this lattice here, machining is uh, just not available, or at least classical mechanical machining. So the idea was, what can we do if we have to stay with this? In, in the back of our mind, of course, is the use of those lattices. OK, so this is the outline. Um, we'll just show, say a few words about the materials then why they fail and how they fail and what we used in terms of surface post-treatments, chemical etching and shot peeling and a few words of conclusion. But first of all, I, I, I have a sort of lied because when I talk about <coughs> lattices, we have never worked with any lattices for the moment. Well, actually, it's a postdoc on the way, but we have decided to simplify this <coughs> by this type of sample for the good reason that if you use a tetras lattice like this, it works in tension or in compression. <coughs> so we decided to study the behavior of one uh, elementary part, if you like, mimicked by this type of samples, which are going to be fatigue in tension. Uh, this is classical TA64. This is EBM, uh, ELI powder. EBM is fast uh, and uh, you hit the plate, the building plate, so residual spaces are negligible, so no need of additional heat treatment. But as you will see, there are some drawbacks, like for example, surface properties. Um, we, like many others, have studied three orientations, 0, 45, and 90 degrees. Samples are quite thin, as I said in the title, two millimeter diameter. That means a large uh, surface of a bulk ratio. And here I'm only showing the result for the 90 degree samples. This is what the materials look like. This is a 3D rendering of from uh, X-ray tomography. So it's pretty horrible. As you can say, there is a large roughness and the roughness is orientation dependent. Um, defects are also present in the bulk. They are the usual customers, if you can say so. Um, Internal uh, prosthetic coming from atomization, lack of fusion defects, which are more or less planar defect perpendicular to the tensile stress, which are going to be nasty. But in fact, here, they don't really matter. What's important is the surface. And at the surface, you find another zoology of defects, like stuck powder, but they don't play any role here, or what we call plate pile stacking defects. That's two piles of uh, powders which are not exactly coinciding, and what we call notch defects. So at the end of those plate pile stacking defects, sometimes you get something like which looks like a crack. It's a thin notch within the material. And of course, um, this is not very good for fatigue. It's a very limited porosity, less than 10 to <coughs> minus 4. Um, so first of all, as everybody else, we did the volo curve. Um, this is the reference data from ARCAM. And um, this is what they, exactly what I explained before. They machine the samples, produce the volume curve, and it's quite high. I mean, uh, 400 megapascal for the fatigue limit, it's not bad. But if you work with the SBL state, 
you're much, much lower, of course, slightly above 100, which is very low, and it's clearly not acceptable. I forgot to say that it's 0.1 R ratio, 10 hertz. This is typical for aerospace industry, and we are also going to have a lot of points at 10 to the 5 cycle, because that's what's important for the aerospace. Okay, what are the um, fatigue mechanisms? Well, if you start from the fracture surface, you clearly see that the cracks, this is the stable crack propagation region, cracks starts from defects like this, which are those thin notches that I showed you, which you can then identify on your tomographic scan, and along all the sample gauge lengths, you can identify which sample was responsible for the failure. So, one example here, one sample, fracture surface, two defects, two notches, which are here on the tomography image, and here in the same tomography image, but seen in a different direction. And you see that clearly those notch-like defects are very important. In every case, all the time, the cracks start from there. So in aerospace industry, people like a lot hot isostatic pressing, so we did it. But of course, as you can guess, it has no effect. Because, uh, so no effect means that you go from those points to those ones, so they just fall on top of each other here. And that's for sure because heat has no effect on the surface. So you cannot close the notch using heat, so it's useless. Well, in some sense it's good news because uh, it's quite a costly and long process to do it. Um, so what else did we try? Well, we tried uh, chemical etching. Chemical etching in that case is just plunging the sample in a nasty mixture of uh, fluoridric and nitric acids, room temperature, no steering for a few minutes. Well, a few, it's nearly an hour. So this is the roughness, decreases with the etching time, of course. And you see here, after three quarters of an hour, tends to stabilize, while the volume of material that you're removing is not stabilizing. But of course, at some stage, you have to stop because the sample is already thin. So after one hour, you're left with nearly nothing, right? So we decided to stop after 45 minutes. You see that the surface state is much better, of course, but it's still not that good. I mean, if you have good eyes, uh, you can see maybe that there are some parts of the notch which remains there. Um, if you want to see that more clearly, this is again tomography on the samples before etching in dark gray and after, same sample, same location. And clearly you see that the etching does remove 250 micron, roughly, and it completely suppress those defects. But sometimes you have some remnants of the notches which were there before, right? And of course they're going to play a role. What is the fatigue properties of this type of etched samples? It's the yellow points which are there. So you see that the good news is that we are going up. Okay, there is a 60% increase in the fatigue limit. However, there is one bad news, which is the scatter. Because you see, the material is bad, but it consistently bad, right? And that you have a very reduced scatter in the S-build state. Why, when you etch the sample, you see that the scatter becomes considerable. And this is, of course, because you are left with some defects, but they are rarer. Okay, like here, this sample broke from here on this notch, which was there, and which is a remnant of what was there before etching, right? So that introduces a large scatter. Of course, if you would leave the sample in the acid longer, maybe you would manage to remove this, but at the expense of the thickness of the whole sample. So 45 minutes is a sort of a trade-off, okay? Now, if uh, those samples fail from those defects which are rare, we decided to start looking for them in a systematic way. So I'll briefly explain that, although it's a quite a complex process to do. Basically, you start from the 3D image, take the surface of the sample that you unfold, and you end up with a gray-level image, which is maybe better here, a gray-level image, which is the surface of your sample, and the gray-level is a measure of the amount of material which is behind the surface. A darker area means a hole or a depression on the surface. So by simply thresholding the image, you get all the notches at the surface. And you can set a level and you extract, well, for example, the 21st defect in terms of depth, like this. 
And using this data, so here it's a manual check. We check by eye on the tomographic image, the other one, the round one, without unfolding. And we found them, and we check that by thresholding. We still have them. And we still have them. It works. And also the critical one, the one from which the sample has failed. So uh, we can then use this data to plot the Kitagawa diagrams. So I'm sure you're familiar with this. Just to say that here the horizontal limit is taken from the literature data, the one which is given by the manufacturer of the EVM machine. And this part here is drawn from the literature. That's actually an issue because you need to have uh, the relevant data for your, your material, right? Does it work? Well, uh, for runouts, it does work. So samples which have survived one million cycle down here, along below the blue curve, and that says that, of course, we are on the right side. If you uh, try to do the same thing on the unbroken plus heat plus etching, it also works. And you can try to do the same with the broken samples, but in this case, we're cheating a little bit in the sense that uh, they are no more close to the fatigue limit. So, here you see the scatter of point, which is all the defects present in the sample. The red dots are the killer defects. And you see that nearly all the time, except in two occasions, they are above the line, which says, which shows that this Kitagra diagram, they can tell you if the defects will be critical or not. So that's quite a good news. Um, something which is more uh, interesting, I think, and more puzzling, if you try now to relate the defect probability of initiating the, crack, the fatal crack to the size, so that's the defect size, various samples here. You see that clearly, and you plot the 20 largest, clearly the defect which fails is not the largest one. And not the largest in the sense of Murakami as the predicted area of the, uh, the defect. So clearly there is something else. Okay, maybe the radius of curvature at the tip of the, yeah. of the notch. Yes, probably. Uh, anyway, the last thing we tried to do, because I think I'm running out of time, is uh, short Leave pinning. Your okay, it's short <laughs> pinning. Uh, maybe the only thing to mention here is that it's ultrasonic. We use a sonotrope to move the steel balls, which are one millimeter steel balls, and that, of course, is quite impressive and effective in improving the surface state. You could even say that it's better than the chemical etching. Again. Dark gray level is the as built, and the light gray level is after shot pinning. Okay, so you see that you smear all the protuberances <coughs> along the cylinder, which is more or less regular. Okay, so it looks good. Is it good in fatigue? Well, yes. Uh, so just a reminder because it's getting crowded. As built, etched, and the shot pin samples are here, right? So we are nearly at the level of the machine sample. Machine without heaping, machine plus heaping is there. So uh, if you try to heap on top of uh, shot pinning, we are from here to here, only one point, because one PhD is only three years, right? So we are going up. It's the right trend, but we haven't reached this uh, level here, which is the, the maximum that you can get from, from this material when you machine that. The reason why we are not high enough, well, I, I, I leave this for the question, right? Um, it's time to conclude, I think. Um, <laughs> well, the chairman is pushing me to slow We have down. one uh, <laughs> presentation that is missing. So ah, I didn't know thing. that. Right. Well, I could have <laughs> right, okay. So he's tempting me. So I, I'll tell you why, why we are not so good in uh, with the shot pinning, right? Okay, I, I know you want to know. Um, what do we see on the fracture surface of the shot pin sample? Well, the cracks, like in all the cases, start from the surface. So we haven't solved the surface problem yet. So this is the fracture surface. Okay. Now, if you look at the same sample in tomography, it looks like this. Okay. So apparently a very nice surface, but a remaining hole. Okay. Now, if you merge both, the remaining hole does fit within the fracture surface, but this looks a lot like one of the initial notches which were there. So what we believe is happening, and this, sorry, there was a missing part. This is the scan, tomographic scan before the shot pinning, same region. So you go from this to this. So what's happening is that, or from, from the blue line to the red line. What's happening probably is that when you shot pin, 
you just smear everything, okay? You fold all the protuberances, but sometimes <coughs> you can remain with a void, an internal void inside the sample. And indeed, this void is creating some problems. So why are we still higher? Well, the reason is that, in fact, you have compressive stresses because of the shock pin. So it's a, it's a balanced effect. We have compressive stresses, but we have some remaining defects below the surface. And so that's the reason why we have not achieved the, the, the complete uh, success. And to be honest, shot pinning is probably all right for this type of sample. For a lattice, I think it will be harder to apply, right? Because the steel ball, <coughs> one millimeter, I'm not sure they can reach the nodes of the lattices. But chemical etching might be a solution. Thank you for the extra time, Mr. Chairman. So if I come back to the conclusion, and, uh, I can't leave you reading this, but uh, I think the main result, uh, the main message is uh, if you don't want to machine the samples, there are some solutions. They are maybe not as effective as machining, but they can at least reach 60% uh, of what you could achieve with a good mechanical machine. And for lattices, that makes a big difference. And thank you very much. Great students.